Yo, welcome to this video on traditions and encounters about chapter 9, where we will talk about India in the classical period. So, you may remember that India is always decentralized unless it's not, and in this time period, there were two dynasties that were able to centralize India. So, this is the time where we talk about the temporary unification of India, although it didn't always last long. So, after Alexander of Macedon withdrew from India because his troops sort of like gave up on India, there was really this power vacuum, and into this came a guy named Chandragupta Maurya, and he began his conquests, and eventually he would go on to found the Mauryan Empire, the first of the two Indian empires we'll learn in this video. And so he sort of began all this, and he, he founded the Maurya dynasty stretching from Bactria to the Ganges River. Bactria, is, of course, is like Afghanistan over -ish. And he really set this stage for the great emperor Ashoka Maurya, or simply known as Ashoka. And Ashoka reigned right before the time of Christ, about 200 years before, so he's before the split. And what did Ashoka do? Uh, first, he conquered the kingdom of Kalinga, so he was establishing himself as a powerful ruler. And then he ruled through a tightly organized bureaucracy, something of central governments that didn't really happen before. He established a vast capital at Pat Pataliputra, which was his capital city. And he also wrote policies on rocks and pillars, and many historians can still read them today. And these were called the Edicts of Ashoka, or Ashoka's Edicts. But eventually his empire declined because there were financial problems, the money wasn't managed well, and so it fell. But this was a really big deal for Indian centralization. So after the Mauryan fell, there was this time split, but eventually a new group came, and those were the Guptas. So the Gupta dynasty was founded by Chandra Gupta after the time of Jesus, so sort of to put it in perspective. And his empire was smaller and more decentralized than the Maurya, so it didn't necessarily match up, but it was still centralized nonetheless. But eventually he ran into some problems too, and his empire fell because white Huns, who were nomads, weakened the empire. They invaded from the north, and that was that. Although large regional kingdoms did continue to dominate political life in India afterwards. These two were the two major kingdoms though, Mari and Gupta, so it's good to remember. So what was life like in this time? Well, there was trade definitely because India had good waterways and they were right next to the Indian Ocean. And there was also the family life and the caste system we talked about previously. So like the gender relations, the patriarchal families, the female subordination, and even child marriage where like young brides would be married off. And through this time, the trade and commerce really produced new classes too. So there were artisans, craftsmen, and merchants, and it really just helped give India an economic boom at this time. Also, new social groups formed in addition to the caste system. There were subcastes, and they were known as jati, so something important to know. And also, we see old beliefs and values of Aryan society become increasingly irrelevant. New faiths started to arise as well. And among these new faiths, one was Jainism. Jainism was founded by the Jina, and he founded this around 5th century BC. And basically, he was inspired by the Upanishads, and his thinking was really, we need to purify one selfish behavior. So people are really, unfortunately, selfish. And he also lived by the principle of Ahimsa, which is nonviolence toward all living things. So a lot of Jains are vegetarians. And you see Gandhi really adopt this hundreds of years later. But ultimately, this religion was too demanding and people didn't really adopt it that much. Although it did set the stage for other religions that came later. So Jainism was popular because it didn't recognize the so social hierarchies of caste and jati. So everyone was equal in its thinking. Now, a similar one is Buddhism. Buddhism was founded by Siddhartha Gautama, and he lived behind before the time of Jesus as well, about 500 to 400 BC. And basically, he was born this Hindu prince, and he lived a comfortable life. But one day, he saw like dead people on the street, and he really was moved by it. So he went to start thinking, and he received enlightenment under the bow tree. And from the bow tree, he was able to start Buddhism, which was this new set of thinking that was much different from the Hindu caste system that was already heavily dominant. 
And basically, he organized his followers into a community of monks. So you have the Buddhist monasteries you may remember from Old World Encounters. And he also had some Buddhist doctrines, so the Dharma. And these include the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. And you have to follow this according to Buddhism to end suffering. And suffering is caused by human greed, human desire, and is bad for you. And the religious goal is for personal salvation or nirvana. And it's a state of perfect spiritual independence. Now, Buddhism was sort of like Jainism. It appealed strongly to members of the lower caste because it didn't have the hierarchies of caste and jati. And because it was less demanding, it became more popular. But it was also good because they spoke the vernacular tongue. So that's the common language of the people, not Sanskrit, like the old ancient Indian languages. And one important person to know is Ashoka. Ashoka was actually a convert to Buddhism, and he really helped promote it during his time ruling the Maurya Empire. And finally, there's this one branch you may remember, Mahayana Buddhism, and that's just a greater vehicle. In early Buddhism, there were heavy demands on individuals, so Mahayana decided to be sort of more liberal, more free. And through this, they were able to build up, and monasteries began to accept gifts from wealthy individuals, and that really helped the monastery and Buddhism spread and grow. And these changes were to become Mahayana Buddhism. And all these things really just helped to diffuse Buddhism. But ultimately, the emergence of popular Hinduism, which was more based on Aryan original beliefs, really started to rise. So like the epics, Mahabharata, poems, they really started to come back into Indian society. And the Gupta actually adopted Hinduism, unlike the Mauryans who came before. And Hinduism really just started to go back into India, the caste system, a part of Hinduism, all of it. And even today, you still see much Hinduism. And eventually, Hinduism was able to replace Buddhism in India, partly because of political adoption, but also because Buddhism was diffusing to other areas such as East Asia, like China. And so there was less of a stronghold in India for Buddhism. But it's always too... Re- it. It's always important to remember that Buddhism got its roots in India. That's something a lot of people don't seem to know. In conclusion, this has been chapter 9. We talked about India in the classical age. And yeah, that's it. Two important empires, Maria Gupta, remember them, and you're good to go. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you in the next one.